Welcome to another edition of Glomcon's Practice Changing Clinical Trials interviews, uh, where we discuss recently completed and ongoing practice changing uh, GN trials. Um, I'm Manasi Bapet, a uh, nephrologist at Kaiser Permanente Walnut Creek, California. Today, we will be talking about the 2024 KD Gold Lupus Nephritis Guidelines. I'm Vinesh Ranavasan. I'm an academic nephrologist and Glomcon faculty member at Cooper University Hospital and Cooper uh, Medical School of Robin University, New Jersey. And today, we're thrilled to have Dr. Brad Robin. Dr. Rovin is the Lee A. Hebert Distinguished Professor of Nephrology at The Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center and the Division Director. Um, Dr. Robin is an internationally recognized expert in glomerular disease and especially lupus nephritis. He is the 2024 KDGO Workgroup Co-Chair. Dr. Robin, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and we're thrilled to have your expertise for today. It's really my pleasure to be here and thanks for uh, having me. Welcome. Um, the first question I had was uh, the most significant change in the 2024 lupus nephritis guidelines is um, the addition of mucosporin and belumumab as the initial agents um, for class 3 and class 4 lupus nephritis on top of cyclophosphamide and mycophenolate. Um, can you talk a little bit about the evidence that led uh, to this major upgrade in the status of these two drugs? Yeah, the evidence uh, primarily comes from the uh, phase uh, three uh, Bliss LN trial, looking at belumumab added to uh, standard of care, uh, and then the phase three Aurora one trial, uh, looking at focalosporin added to standard of care, coupled with the phase two Aurora data as well, giving us a, a large number of patients with lupus nephritis. Both of these trials showed that uh, when these additional drugs, either belumumab or focalosporin, were added to standard of care regimens uh, at the start of treatment, uh, that the patients receiving the drug compared to the patients receiving placebo uh, had a significantly higher uh, renal response rate. Renal response was uh, differentially defined in the clinical trials, and, and I'll just put parentheses around it. We really need to do better than that. It would be really nice if we had a standard endpoint for all of our trials so we could actually compare them um, uh, we compared the endpoints. Uh, the Bliss LN trial was quite interesting uh, using a um, endpoint called PERR, uh, which is very similar to complete renal response, and it stands for primary efficacy renal response, but it's a little bit of more relaxed criteria in terms of proteinuria. So for complete renal response, usually we want to see proteinuria uh, 500 milligrams a day or less, a reduction down to that level, and uh, a GFR that is near normal. And that was the criteria for CRR, which was a second end, a secondary endpoint in the Bliss LN trial. For the PERR endpoint, uh, that was uh, proteinuria had to be less than 800 milligrams a day, and uh, GFR uh, better than 60 mil per minute per by the surface area. Uh, nonetheless, both of them reflected the same sort of effect size of about a 10% uh, increase in renal responses in patients treated with uh, belumumab as opposed to placebo on top of standard of care. The evidence for vocalosporin, uh, and in vocalosporin, they used a definition of uh, complete renal response, which was a little bit mixed. Uh, GFR had to be better than 60, proteinuria less than 500. And here we saw an increase uh, in uh, complete renal responses as defined within six months of starting uh, vocalosporin, and that effect size was about 20% compared to the placebo uh, at 12 months, which was the primary endpoint of that trial. The other thing that I, th I, I should note is that the Bliss LN trial was unique. It was the first trial that we did over two years, as opposed to six months or one year, which had been traditional in the past. And I think that also provided a lot of insight into what the drug was doing and how it might be applied uh, to patients um, from post hoc analyses over that length of time. Got it. Thank you. Um, with more choices now for initial management of class three and class four lupus, um, what is your approach towards deciding um, whether to start a patient on two versus three immunosuppressives for induction therapy? Well, so um, one of the issues we always face with guidelines is that they're algorithmic and no patient follows the textbook or an algorithm. So I, I do think I, I want to make it clear to the audience that, you know, we do have to think through each patient. It's it's clear that in both of these clinical trials with Voclo and Belumumab, there were a substantial percentage of patients 
treated with standard of care alone that reach uh, a complete renal response. So, so the trick is, can we predict those patients and then differentiate them from those who might need triple therapy. So there's a several philosophies that are floating around right now. And, and the philosophies are, you know, well, let's start with two drugs and then accelerate if need be. Let's start with three drugs and give everybody the best chance possible. Um, and, and of course, in, in a perfect world where price wasn't an issue where accessibility wasn't an issue, one might choose three drugs, a three drug regimen uh, all the time. Now, um, I, there's a lot of caveats to that, and I know we don't have forever, and I also know that I tend to talk forever, so I'm going to try to be brief, but I, I think that uh, what I'm looking at now in my practice is trying to understand what the what the additional benefits of, of these medications are beyond simply complete renal response. And the reason I say that is because if you look at both trials, um, when you look at the endpoint, the number of patients achieving a complete renal response in each trial was under 50%. So that means 50% of the patients didn't respond or only had a partial response. And in, in, in my opinion, that's not adequate, but that's often what we're left with. So what I like about these uh, two drugs is they both provide some benefits beyond um, simply remission or response. And um, what we're looking at a lot in our practice is uh, starting with three drugs, including a calcineurin inhibitor. And because we have availability for voclosporin, uh, we tend to use that when we can get it. Uh, other parts of the world, voclo is not available, for example, and, and tacrolimus can substitute uh, because there's a lot of nice data from Asia suggesting uh, tacrolimus was efficacious added to uh, mycophenolate and glucocorticoid. And um, the reason, uh, one of the reasons or one of the thinking, uh, the ways I'm thinking about this is not only does voclosporin help achieve a proteinuric response very quickly, and proteinuria in and of itself can be toxic to the kidney parenchyma, it also is podocyte protective. And as you know, early in the disease, when we're having immune complex deposition, uh, injuring the glomeruli and the, and the podocyte foot processes, we want to preserve the podocyte structure as much as possible uh, and prevent prevent loss of podocytes because podocytes may be an undifferentiated cell that was difficult to replace. I know there's controversy on that in, in the GN world, but nonetheless, preservation of podocytes up front will uh, lead to preservations of nephrons down the road, which is ultimately what we want to do. We want to preserve renal survival. Uh, similarly, when I think about using uh, belumumab, I, I actually, again, look at the postdoc data, and I had the opportunity to work at, on, these, on these analyses, and you can see that belumumab prevents LN flares. And we got that because it was a two-year trial. And that's very exciting because every time you have an LN flare, you have acute injury that develops into chronic injury and then pushes the disease along a, a loss of survival uh, pathway. And so that might be folded in later as a, as, a, um, as a way to prevent flares. And so you see, I think we need to start thinking about all of the data putting it together in, and then looking at the specific patient and saying, well, this patient has very heavy proteinuria and I want to get that under control quickly and the calcineurin inhibitor might be great. And this patient has had a lot of flares in the past and the next flare might be just enough to tip them over into ESKD. So we want to prevent flares and, and a drug might be appropriate there uh, like belumumab and so on. Uh, so it's hard to say, but overall, I am leaning towards the three drug regimen to give the patients multiple opportunities to get their disease under control and, and try to prevent or ameliorate chronic damage. Uh, I do realize that, that in some patients with maybe less aggressive lupus, it may be reasonable to start with a two drug approach. What I'm clamoring for, and I think you, you all are probably thinking about is, we need biomarkers to help us decide who's going to respond to what and in what time frame, et cetera. And that's where the next big advances in the field should be, I think. Thank you, Dr. Rovin. Um, with Belumumab and Voclosporin now Class 1B recommendations in the new guidelines, what impact do you expect we can have in terms of broader availability, 
um, access and cost for these newer medications for patients with lupus nephritis? Yeah, well, that's that's the million dollar question, literally, isn't it? Um, uh, you, you know, availability, of course, uh, in the United States, we have availability of of these medications, as you know, so we're very fortunate. Um, that availability is tempered sometimes by insurance companies, but we can usually reason uh, with them. Many parts of the world, these drugs are not available and, and conceivably they won't be available uh, for the foreseeable future. Uh, I think, you know, we have to advocate for our patients for sure. Uh, we have to think about their mechanisms of actions, uh, you know, in, in places where the drugs might not be available. For example, in some countries, you may have calcineurin inhibitors, you definitely do, uh, but you may not have access to voclosporin. And so can you use another calcineurin inhibitor? And, and the answer is yes. Uh, of course you can, and, and people have been doing that for, for some period of time. Um, you know, the biologics, a little bit different. Belumumab is sort of getting pretty worldwide uh, in availability, but then you brought up an appropriately so cost. And I think, um, you know, cost is determined by a lot of factors that none of us have any influence over. Um, but I, 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 my hope is that as these novel drugs are used more and more, that it could drive the price down. Now, that may be a, a naive and unrealistic expectation on my part, but I do really uh, want patients outside of economically privileged countries uh, who are really need these medications um, to have availability. So I think that's something we, we can as a group work on um, with insurers, governments, and um, and um, in pharma. And I think that's one of the goals, for example, of the International Society of Nephrology, right? Make kidney care available. That's one of the themes of, of the ISN, make kidney care available worldwide. And I, I think we, we all should take a part in that, all of us active nephrologists. Now you make um, some very good points, Dr. Rovin. Um, and in what other ways do the new um, lupus nephritis guidelines differ from the prior 2021 edition? I think the other big thing that that I wanted to point out in, in, in this, in this uh, discussion is we are and have realized, I mean, we all realize it, but we're putting it down on paper now. You know, lupus nephritis is an acute kidney disease. And of course, that's the way trials are done. Acute lupus nephritis, it's active. We want to get it under control. But the reality is lupus nephritis, like all of our GNs, is a chronic kidney disease. And even with the very first episode of, of LN, you develop chronic damage in the kidney and you, by definition, have chronic kidney disease. Um, structurally anyway, it may not be apparent clinically because of the way we measure things. Uh, and so I, I think the guidelines started dis the discussion of how should we be thinking about really holistically taking care of the kidney over a lupus patient's lifetime. And that's really critical because you and I see patients acutely and they may move on and, you know, change, you know, locations, et cetera. But we want to keep them off the need for renal replacement therapy really for their lifetime. And beyond that, we want to minimize um, um, the level of chronic kidney disease they develop. As you both know, uh, lupus itself is an independent risk factor for early cardiovascular morbidity and and lupus uh, and chronic kidney disease is again an independent risk factor of cardiovascular morbidity. So my goals are really preservation of kidney function, uh, really avoiding renal replacement therapy when conceivable and minimizing the progressive nature of chronic kidney disease. And that's what we do discuss in this latest version. And of course we mention, you know, the SGLT2 inhibitors because everybody has SGLT2 inhibitors on their mind. Uh, there's not a lot of good data, particularly in lupus nephritis right now. Um, I do use SGLT2 inhibitors in my patients uh, with LN when I've got their immunologic disease under control and they have ongoing proteinuria and impaired renal function and tolerate it pretty well. Uh, we do have to watch out for, you know, urinary tract infections, that sort of thing. Um, but I think we're going to see how this develops. And I, I think this is the first uh, KDGO guideline where we actually embrace this idea of caring for the kidney holistically and understanding that this is a chronic process that needs probably different sorts of approaches over the lifetime of the kidney and the patient. 
that is great more and more patient-centered approach is what we are all headed for hoping yes. for um last but not the least um what are you most excited uh in the landscape of you know treatments for lupus nephritis that are under investigation or in pipeline okay well that's a fair question because um success begets success and this is to me and, and hopefully for the folks listening is really really to me a renaissance in 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 nephrology because we're we're starting to see investment in glomerular diseases at the beginning, but also CKD from pharma and industry in in our diseases. And so I really am excited about um, the B-cell therapies that are coming down the pike. Um, we have participated in the trial of obinutuzumab. Um, and full disclosure, I do consult with Roche Genentech, um, but but the data speak for themselves. Uh, the, the phase two date, of course, and the phase three will wrap up uh, sometime in the fall. Um, that's a very exciting possibility because, like rituximab, it's very well tolerated, and the data are very compelling uh, that it does provide benefit. The uh, uh, sort of gorilla in the room, if you will, is really B cell depletion with CAR T cell therapy, and I'm sure uh, uh, the the audience is aware of that. We're participating in a CAR T cell. Cell, uh, trial. Uh, we're at this point, this is a very rigorous therapy, as you know, and we're enrolling patients that are refractory, which is not an easy patient to find necessarily who's truly refractory. But um, th this idea, what we're learning from the CART T cells is that depth and quality of B cell depletion, and what we're learning from obinutuzumab, again, depth and quality of B cell depletion, might actually be very favorable in keeping the disease in under a response state for a long period of time. So I think that's a, a very exciting approach. Uh, we also are looking at um, proteasome inhibitors and, and then ways to target plasma cells, uh, which is another end of the B cell spectrum. And I think what we're ultimately going to see is that combinations of therapy staged at various parts of the LN journey, if, you, if I can call it that, will be appropriate. And what I hope is that we will use the kidney biopsy and we are studying kidney biopsy in a number of venues uh, the amp aim through the um, nih is one of those venues understanding you know what pathways are active early in the disease mid disease later disease can we then use all of these new drugs to make a targeted approach that's appropriate for what is happening at the time you make the diagnosis. And to me, as you said, uh, this is patient-centered, this is precision medicine, and this is where we want to be um, in, in the next five to 10 years. I think we all agree with that approach, Dr. Rogan, but um, we wanted to thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to meet with us. I think we all really appreciate your expertise. Well, thank you. It was a pleasure being here. So good luck and see you down the road.